It was a three-way standoff between a giant plant eater, a pack of raptors, and a T-Rex. Now, forensic evidence, including incredibly rare mummified remains, let investigators uncover a mind-blowing prehistoric battle. They're the Earth's first fighters, the ultimate predators. New discoveries in forensic science bring to life the prehistoric art of war. This is Jurassic Fight Club. Nineteen ninety seven. A ranch in northeastern South Dakota. A fossil hunter is on a routine dig when he suddenly spots the remains of a large dinosaur jutting out of the side of a hill. To identify the bones, paleontologists now rely on experience and acute knowledge of what other species of dinosaur have been found in the same area. Usually when you're finding dinosaurs, you got a pretty good idea as to what you're gonna find. If you're in the late Cretaceous, you have a good chance of finding like a duckbill dinosaur or a triceratops or a tyrannosaurus. And so you've got some idea of who the cast of characters are you might find. But very often it's not until you've actually excavated a series of bones that you can really start to get a handle on what kind of dinosaur you have. If I find uh, even a fragment of a tooth, with the serrations on it of a carnivorous dinosaur, I can often tell you exactly what kind of carnivorous dinosaur that belongs to. I don't need a whole tooth to tell you what it is. I can tell from the size, I can tell from the shape of the serrations, and so on. Paleontologists uncovered more of the skeleton and then compared them to the bones of other dinosaurs found nearby they realized they were looking at a monster. It was a duck-billed dinosaur, Edmontosaurus. These dinosaurs were over 40 feet long, stood 13 feet at the hips, and weighed nearly four tons, about the size of a railroad boxcar. These are really big dinosaurs with massive tails but their body design is perfectly balanced so that their center of gravity is directly over their hips. This allows them to grow large, but still remain fairly agile. Their size is impressive, but what makes these duck-billed dinosaurs look so cool is that real funky skull. The feature that earned them the name duckbill was an elongated nose and flat beak. But one of the most striking features of the dinosaur was that its mouth housed well over a thousand teeth. And like a modern shark, it lost and grew new teeth throughout its life. They had a battery of, of 1,300 teeth in their, in their jaws at one time that would just keep growing and growing and growing. They would grind their food. Uh, they, they ate, we found actually, stomach contents in some of these animals, showing that they ate sequoias and other plants that were found in the region. The ability to chew through plants allowed Edmontosaurus to swarm across much of prehistoric Earth. We find them preserved in the uplands, so in the more woody parts in the hills, the foothills of the early Rockies. We find them in the stream valleys. We find them in swampy environments. We even find duckbills that lived all the way down to the coasts. So that some of them lived on the shores. So a duckbill like Edmontosaurus, we find actually in several different types of environments. It functioned pretty well in forests, in the streams, in the swamps. As long as it could find some plants to eat, a duckbill was happy. It's their ability to eat the tough plants of the late Cretaceous that allows Edmontosaurus to outcompete and ultimately replace earlier dinosaurs like Tenonosaurus. And it also allowed them to grow 40 feet in length and stand tall enough to look through the upstairs window of a two-story house. Edmontosaurus was one of the largest herbivores in North America. 
its large size also helped protect it from vicious predators. Once these dinosaurs reached adulthood, their size made them less of a target from attack. The juveniles and subadults, on the other hand, were in constant danger, especially the subadult males. Once they reached a certain age, I think they were driven from the herd and sent off on their own to mature and form herds of their own. A single bull would need to be on the alert to every form of danger. Lacking armor and obvious weapons, at first glance, this dinosaur looked like easy prey. But when investigators inspected the skeletal design, they found that they were far from helpless. A big adult in Montosaurus is bigger than a rhino, as big as an Indian elephant. So that's a big hunk of meat. If you're that big, you can defend yourself just by whapping your tail around, by kicking out with your legs, and even by smacking it with that big duck bill. If you're an Edmontosaurus and you're under attack, the first thing you want to do is run away. Although it's a fairly large animal, it was still relatively fast. But if it couldn't outrun its attacker, then it used its massive tail. It could swing that thing like an oversized baseball bat and crush its opponent if it could hit it. Today, there's one clear link that gives scientists insight into prehistoric behavior. It's animal instinct, which does not change through thousands of generations. Well, Montosaurus was sort of the wildebeest of the Cretaceous plains. It was actually larger than a wildebeest, but in terms of dinosaur communities, it would be in that approximate size range. The reality is, is they probably had a couple of different strategies to deal with predators. So one of which is by their sensory component, where they actually have a good sense of hearing, they have a good sense of vision, um, they can sense, sense the predators and avoid them before the predators get close enough to do any damage. Another strategy that virtually all, or many, many prey animals have today is to have many sensory systems working at the same, same time. In other words, they live in groups, they live in herds. Consequently, the idea of predator detection becomes enhanced with living in a group. Fossil evidence found in sites throughout North America suggested that these dinosaurs traveled in herds. They lived in very, very large herds, perhaps as many as 10 to 20,000 individuals in a herd. Clearly, they had to migrate. There's no way you can support large herds like that without them moving around, because they're going to literally decimate uh, the foliage in an area as, they, as they're moving along. But the remains at the site only showed one duckbill. Why wasn't it in a herd? Since this duckbill skeleton was found by itself, it's easy to believe that it was either separated from the herd or was alone when it was attacked. There's no evidence that any other duckbills were with it. When feeding, these dinosaurs stood on all fours. But there was one stunning feature in the way it moved. When they had to, Duckbills had a special adaptation. They walked on two legs. We know by studying a lot of fossil footprints that Edmontosaurus and its relatives walked on two legs most of the time. I'm sure that larger members found it easier to walk on all fours, but when they needed to, they could get up on their hind legs and run. Maybe not incredibly fast, but hopefully faster than their attacker. In 1998, the investigation deepened. CAT scan research was performed by Larry Whitmer. The scans revealed a vital clue. The Edmontosaurus may not have been as fast as previously thought. One idea that we can do uh, to, to get some sense of, of the agility of these animals is to actually look inside their heads. 
and look at the structure of, of the brain and particularly the inner ear, which we can get from CT scanning. And what that tells us is that indeed, adult edmontosaurs were probably not particularly agile animals. They were probably not particularly fleet of foot. They were not relatively quick moving, certainly not as, as sort of plodding as, as what we think many of the, the long neck sauropods were like. When paleontologists CAT scan dinosaur skulls, they get a very clear idea of the shape of the brain. By comparing that brain to modern animal brains, they're able to figure out which part of the brain is dedicated to which sense. So if the olfactory section of the brain is enlarged, then it tells scientists that the animal's sense of smell was more advanced than one with a smaller part of the brain dedicated to that same sense. So the use of CAT scanning is an example of how experts are able to give us an idea of a dinosaur's vision, hearing, and even speed and agility. But as more of the skeleton was unearthed from the hillside, the mystery deepened. Most of the skeleton was missing. The only body part that remained was its tail. The tail was a staggering 23 feet long. But what could have happened to the other half of this dinosaur? Had it been attacked and partially eaten? Then another discovery. The tail was covered in fossilized skin. It had been mummified. The discovery of fossilized skin is not unheard of, but it's remarkably rare. I've had the opportunity to study a large duckbill named TC whose neck and body parts are covered in fossilized skin. We don't fully understand the process that causes some dinosaur skin to mummify, but the end result allows us to study the skin texture of the dinosaur. We're unable to determine the original skin color, but at least we get a look at the thickness and texture. The discovery of a duck-billed dinosaur tail covered in skin was unprecedented, but it would pale in comparison to what they found next. A second beast and forensic proof of massive dinosaur carnage that took place over 65 million years ago. It is a find unlike any in modern science. The tail of a giant plant eater had been discovered. And incredibly, its mummified skin survived. Investigators studied the skin and realized it held something else. Bite marks, deep gashes in the bone. They were from a predator. Looking at the tooth marks left in the skin of the tail of this dinosaur, my first reaction was, holy cow, it's been bitten. But then as you look more closely, you see that these tooth marks are relatively small and very few in numbers. Whatever had left the tooth marks was not very big and certainly not overly powerful. And then, another clue. Sifting through the soil found in and around the bones, they found numerous small teeth with serrated edges. They would reveal the identity of the dinosaur that feasted on the duckbill. These teeth belong to a lethal predator. It was Dromaeosaurus, from the family of raptors. The raptors, or Dromaeosaurus, were generally small animals, um, generally large-brained, large-eyed. They're characterized by a very large claw on the foot, which is kind of like a can opener a very nasty looking claw, which had to be held off the ground, actually, because it was so recurved and sharp at the end. These are incredibly vicious little dinosaurs. 
They're built for speed and maneuverability, and they're armed to the teeth, literally. Although they're very small, one would be more than a match for a grown man, but a pack of these would be pure hell for most of the herbivores that shared their environment. These raptors were small compared to most of the dinosaurs they hunted. They stood only three to four feet tall at the hips, were six feet long, and weighed less than 100 pounds. Their smaller size meant that these dinosaurs had to be cautious when taking on bigger prey. Having a delicate skeleton almost requires that these animals, in a sense, be careful. What that means is that they must have some sort of agility that allows them to use these weapons yet still protect themselves. What's interesting is that we can now, with this new CT technology, look inside their skulls for evidence of that agility. And we find it. When we look at the inner ear, what we see is long, delicate canals that suggest that these animals were relatively quick moving, had good high hand coordination, and likewise, were generally agile animals. When these predators jumped in to inflict damage, they relied on two basic weapons to take down their prey. The first weapon was their teeth. Dromaeosaurus was one of the nastiest dinosaurs that was around. They had a, a rather sh very, very, very sharp row of teeth, very, very blade-like. They were used in kind of a cookie cutter action, if you will. Recurved teeth helps them to slice through the meat. So they, they bite onto something and the teeth tear into it. And they've got these little serrations down the front and the back that tear through the muscle fibers. The recurved part means as the skull pulls back, it carves into the flesh and helps tear out a nice chunk. So it helps them slice through the meat much more effectively. Sharp, serrated, and recurved their teeth were capable of causing some serious damage. But the most powerful weapon in their arsenal was their claws. Basically, I think that uh, raptors relied very heavily on their hands and their feet uh, for killing. Uh, you can see that in the case of a raptor, you have claws that are in fact bigger than its own teeth. That's telling you something right there. Whereas in the case of, uh, say, Tyrannosaurus rex, if you look at the teeth of Tyrannosaurus rex, they're as large as or larger than the claws. Um, so again, there's a reversal there, and it's telling you that, okay, Tyrannosaurs are using their mouth to kill. Dromaeosaurs are probably using their hands and feet more than anything else. To compensate for their smaller size, these raptors may have hunted in packs this would allow them to take on much larger prey. Hunting in packs serves a very important purpose when you're smaller than the prey that you're around. Why spend your day chasing bugs and small rodents when you can take down something much larger? We see this behavior in numerous modern predators like lions, wolves, hyenas, and even crocodiles to a certain extent. When we look at dromaeosaurs, what we see is an expanded cerebrum. Did that expanded cerebrum allow them to hunt in packs? We can't say that. What we can suggest, however, is that they might have had the cognitive capabilities to actually deal with complex situations, potentially to solve problems. Compared to other predatory dinosaurs, they certainly were starting out with a better sort of brain power that potentially could have made that kind of capability possible. Raptors could even communicate with each other verbally, like modern birds. When I looked at the bite marks on the Admonosaurus tail, I could see that they were not very deep and they were relatively small. That suggests to me that whatever bit this dinosaur did not have the jaw strength or long teeth necessary to really bite deep into the hive. And then the discovery of the raptor teeth found nearby clinched it for me. I believe the most likely candidate for whoever left those small bite marks on that tail was Dromaeosaurus. 
But was there other evidence to support the notion that raptors preyed upon the duckbill? Other dinosaur remains found at a second site in South Dakota would prove they did. We actually have a site where we found Dromaeosaurus bones with Edmontosaurus, and, and that's the Ruth Mason Quarry, where we've got a bone bed of several thousand individuals of Edmontosaurus, and every once in a while, we'd find a bone or two of Dromaeosaurus in there. So they were not only contemporaries, but obviously these Dromaeosaurus were out there eating on these Edmontosaurus. But why would only the teeth of a raptor be found near the tail? When predatory dinosaurs like Dromaeosaurus feed, it's not unusual for them to break off a tooth. In fact, their teeth are actually made to break off and be replaced by the tooth growing underneath it. This is a great way to ensure that they always have a sharp set. Unless the Dromaeosaurus is killed in the process of eating his meal, the only evidence you're going to find that they were even there are these broken and shed teeth. But the question still remained. Would a pack of raptors be willing or able to take on a dinosaur 10 times their own size? Would a Dromaeosaurus go after an Edmontosaurus? Well, a single Dromaeosaurus, no way. That'd be suicide for that Dromaeosaurus. It would get crushed. But if there were a situation where a pack of Dromaeosaurus could come at the sides of the Edmontosaurus, the Edmontosaurus is not an armored dinosaur. It's not protected on its sides. The Dromaeosaurus can go after them. And once it starts getting weak, it's going to collapse, and they can finally go after the real killing spot, the throat. Once that throat's really exposed where they can get to it, they can bite in there, they can slash, and that duckbill, it's got no more chance at that point. With deadly claws, a mouthful of meat-slicing teeth, and strength in numbers, science began to paint a picture of a battle between a large plant eater and a pack of raptors. But investigators were about to make another discovery, evidence of a third dinosaur. It was the king of the prehistoric kingdom. And it would change everything experts thought they knew about what happened here. In the badlands of South Dakota, evidence pieced together a picture of a vicious attack between a pack of raptors and a giant duckbill. But a new discovery would suggest that these raptors did not dine alone. Investigators continued to study the remains when they noticed that the tail had a second set of bite marks. But these were not raptors. Stunned is the only word I can think of to describe my feelings when I saw those second bite marks on the tail. These weren't thin, shallow slash marks. These were made by big, round, powerful teeth. And there was only one dinosaur in the late Cretaceous who had the teeth and jaw muscles to make those marks. Tyrannosaurus Rex. T-Rex. The ultimate predator. This was the most powerful and terrifying animal that ever walked the Earth. Every single animal that lived within its territory would have spent their lives in absolute fear of running into this thing. It was truly the ultimate in predatory dinosaurs. There's no animal living today that has had the strength of Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, to try to come up with something that had that kind of power, I don't know, a howitzer, you know, like this, this, this animal was so strong that there's nothing, nothing that could escape if it decided it wanted to eat it. T-Rex stormed planet Earth around 90 million years ago and ruled it for another 25 million years. It weighed in at a staggering seven tons, grew up to 16 feet tall, and ruled a domain from Canada to Texas. 
With its robust teeth and powerful bite, nothing could withstand its attack. T-Rex had to use those teeth to crunch right through bone. And so it couldn't have narrow teeth the way the other carnivorous dinosaurs did. It had to make teeth that were really, really wide and uh, would have been incredibly damaging to anything that it bit. The T-Rex teeth were shaped very distinctly, like a serrated banana. So investigators went back to the drawing board and one thing immediately became clear. The T-Rex did not kill the Edmontosaurus. There are only two big teeth marks on the tail, and so I don't believe a T-Rex killed the dinosaur. Had it attacked and killed it, I suspect we would have seen a lot more evidence of that attack. The tail would have been one of the natural targets of the Rex, so we would expect to see numerous bite marks and crushed and broken bones. But because we don't, it appears that the duckbill was already dead before the T-Rex even showed up. If the T-Rex had attacked the plant eater, the bones would have been pulverized. But the size and shape of the bite marks pointed to a raptor attack. It was a vital clue. This T-Rex came on the scene after the raptors made their move. Experts then took a step back and began to piece together how this battle could have started between the duckbill and a pack of raptors. They began by examining the differences between predator and prey. If we're looking at sheer physical strength, the Edmontosaurus far overwhelms the individual Dromaeosaurus. Its individual leg muscles are probably going to be as heavy as an entire Dromaeosaurus. So uh, it's gonna be far more powerful. And maybe even if you totaled up the muscular strength of all the pack compared to the Edmontosaurus, the Edmontosaurus would still probably win. So this is one where the duckbill is definitely more powerful than the predators. These raptors relied on speed and agility to hunt and kill. It's estimated they could run nearly 40 miles per hour. Raptors, of course, are animals that are very fast and agile. And so the advantage of the dromaeosaurs against an Edmontosaurus would be their speed and agility. By running in and inflicting some damage and then pulling out again, it could wait and see what the reactions are. And because multiple raptors would probably attack at the same time, they would keep the Edmontosaurus' attention away from what the ones were doing in behind until it was too late. Using the tactics of modern wolves and prides of lions would have allowed dinosaurs like Dromaeosaurus to bring down much larger prey. Experts worked off the theory that, as with modern predators, raptors relied on scent to forewarn them of approaching prey. In order for lions and wolves to successfully take down their prey, the first thing they have to do is locate. This is where an acute sense of smell gives them an advantage. Raptors would have relied on the same sense of smell to detect and recognize their prey long before they could see or even hear it. This way, the pack has time to set up an ambush and surprise their victims. We now know that duckbills were among the most common dinosaurs in North America during the late Cretaceous. Experts believe that it defended itself by wielding its tail like a giant club. It is estimated that a direct hit would be enough to send a small car flying. Lots of remains stretched over a wide landscape are a clear sign of success. When it comes to Edmontosaurus, we find tens of thousands of fossilized remains throughout North America. Because we find so many, they certainly had the ability to defend themselves. And so my guess is that the tail was its primary weapon. But you better not count out the raptor. 
It's designed to kill, and so it has a very large arsenal. Discoveries of groups of Deinonychus found at various sites was one of the first clues that members of the raptor family hunted in packs. Although these pack-like hunting methods are used by modern mammals, its origin lies with these early bird-like dinosaurs. The T-Rex had heavier bones than the bird-like dinosaur. Its skeleton was built for heavy-duty power. If a pack of raptors were faced with something as massive as a Tyrannosaurus rex, then they'd be faced with a life-or-death decision, fight or flight. Modern predators are faced with these same decisions every single day. Do you stay and take on your rival, or do you split and then live to fight another day? The T-Rex marked its territory with scent marks, like modern cats, and usually stayed within these boundaries. But unlike most dinosaurs, the T-Rex was large and ferocious enough to venture outside its territory without much fear of attack. Based on the evidence we have, and knowing how modern pack hunting animals prey on large herbivores, we have an idea of what could have occurred. But it's not just random guessing. We use as much science and fossil evidence to support it as possible. Using the latest in high-tech scientific advances and knowledge of animal behavior, experts were able to piece together new clues about how a group of raptors were able to coordinate their attack like a prehistoric company of soldiers. Sixty-five million years ago, where South Dakota is today, A lone duckbill is searching for food. The evidence tells us he has become separated from his herd. In his search for other members of his own kind, the Admonosaurus wanders aimlessly into the forest. His small brain is struggling to adjust to being alone. He has no idea that he's walking right into the center of the territory of a pack of Dromaeosaurus. Dromaeosaurus. It is the scientific name for raptors. It means swift running lizard, and that is how they hunted. They would ambush their prey and run them down. Usually, they would take on smaller prey, but if a large herbivore stumbled across their path, they would attack by instinct. Waiting for the opportune moment to attack, the Dromaeosaurus remained motionless. Then the Admonosaurus walks into view. Its size is immense compared to these little raptors. The rest of the pack won't attack until the Alpha makes a move. Instinct tells her to leave this giant animal alone, but seeing the intruder standing right in the middle of her turf is more than she can take, so she launches the attack. The duckbill had a thick hide and the ability to shake rapidly to throw off attackers. Raptors had terrific balance and were able to land on their feet like cats. With lightning speed, the raptors launch their second attack. This time, they focus on the skull and the neck of the duckbill. Although their claws are sharp, the hide of this Edmontosaurus is really tough and hard to penetrate, so they target a thinner section, and that is the neck. 
Raptors were smart enough to target their attacks to vulnerable areas, such as the eyes and throat. The idea was to disable their victims quickly and watch them bleed to death to avoid a protracted fight that could lead to injury. Now on its hind legs, it's in a position to use its massive weight to its advantage. Waiting for the right moment, it leans forward and crashes to the ground, crushing one of the raptors under its front foot. Raptors had hollow bones, like birds. Even the force of a wooden baseball bat would have broken them in half. But scientists now know something else, that raptors communicated using quick hand gestures. Raptors like Dromaeosaurus have fairly complex brains for a dinosaur. What makes them such efficient killers is that they have the ability to react to a situation in relatively short order. Launching a simultaneous attack is a very effective maneuver when attacking something as big as Edmontosaurus. The Edmontosaurus skin was up to three inches thick and was covered with small, round, armor-like calluses. Because the duckbill's hide is so thick, the raptors are unable to score a decisive blow. But in their case, quantity is just as effective as quality. If they can continue to inflict enough small wounds, the loss of blood will have the same effect as one major injury. This slash and dash approach works well for the raptors, and it keeps them out of harm's way. Smarter, faster, and better armed, the raptor pack continues to launch an endless barrage of attacks. But they have no idea that they've attracted attention. The monster of the prehistoric world is about to hit the scene. A three-way battle is about to erupt. A single male duckbill, unaware of his surroundings, has walked directly into the den of a pack of raptors. The raptor's assault would often be led by an alpha female. The rest of the pack would mimic how and where she attacked. With larger prey, the strategy would be to surround the victim and overwhelm it. There's just no way he can continue to fight these smaller but faster adversaries. If he can make it out of the forest and into the open, he'll have the advantage. There, he'll have the room to swing that massive tail. One hit on that tail on those lightly built raptors will turn them to mush. Raptors were typically cautious creatures, but once they tasted blood in a fight, they were overcome by adrenaline. Almost nothing could make them break off the attack. Their brains focused on only one thing, finishing their prey. This would send them into a fighting frenzy. These raptors know every inch of the terrain. They have a particular spot where they're going to try to drive the duckbill towards. If they can drive him into it, they'll never see the light of day again. typically used to balance its massive frame, was reinforced by a series of interconnecting rods that made it stiff but strong, making it a potent weapon that could be swung like the arm of a crane. The T-Rex was able to sense vibrations through the pads in its feet, allowing it to track large herbivores. 
Tyrannosaurus rex is capable of picking up vibrations through the pads of its feet. The sound waves created by the battle are transmitted through the ground, into the feet, up the skeleton, and then into the inner ear. So T-Rex is able to feel the battle through his feet. Every time the Admonosaurus stomps its foot, it creates a ground tremor, and the Rex uses those tremors to zero in on the target. Admontosaurus's tail was attached to powerful muscles, enabling it to swing with surprising speed. Raptors used a variety of psychological tricks when fighting. This included rushing at the victim's face to confuse it. It was also able to mimic noises, perhaps even echoing the sounds of its prey. Although these cuts to the throat are not deep, the alpha continues to attack the same spot over and over again. These raptors have succeeded in driving this four-ton meal right onto their dinner plate. T-Rex had a superior sense of smell, more powerful even than today's dogs. It could have picked up the scent of blood from miles away. This would immediately send it running. Predators are opportunistic, and the bigger they are, the more opportunities they have. Unfortunately for the raptors, their battle has attracted the attention of the biggest opportunist in North America, and they don't call him the king for nothing. would never fight a T-Rex. These raptors are just outgunned. There is no way they're going to stay and fight. Heck, they won't even stay and challenge this monster. They'll do what small predators have always had to do when someone bigger takes their food. They just have to wait their turn and hope he leaves some scraps. The Tyrannosaurus Rex had massive jaws. Able to open almost five feet wide, it could clamp down around the tail of even the largest herbivores. The T-Rex neck was the width of a grown man's waist and incredibly strong. It could act like a massive steam shovel in picking up prey that weighed over five tons. While it didn't fear other predators, it would still drag its prey back to its own territory like a lion would to avoid a potential fight. Although that tail has meat on it, the most sought-after parts of the carcass lie between the neck and the hips, and that's the part that Tyrannosaurus rex carries off. These raptors have put in way too much energy to just walk away from this meal. Their role has now changed from hunter to scavenger. It's a survival mechanism that all predators share. Pride is not a dinosaur trait. Living to fight another day is. Raptors were fearless fighters. They did not fear any other dinosaur in the world, except the T-Rex. Tyrannosaurus was simply king of the world. Even a pack of raptors was no match for this nightmarish monster who was the most ferocious predator of all time.